There is actually a solution to the universe is beyond problem, and that's what I want to talk about today. There are a couple of key issues that everyone parrots over and over again, and I found that through a poll that I put out on YouTube, Twitter, and, and Discord, where people fell under three big umbrellas. And I think again, there is one solution to this problem that no one wants to push enough. They just want to complain, they just want to talk about how it affects them solely. But again, if we act together and we show Wizards of the Coast that this is the primary issue, then I think we can solve the problem and everyone can be happy. Or, well, you know, everyone has a reason to be mad about magic these days, but it firstly comes down to product fatigue. It can be doubted that Universes Beyond just adds to the long list of things like Secret Lair that are being released what it feels like almost on a weekly basis. Every time that you pop into your LGS, if you don't even interact with Magic Twitter or Magic at Large online, come in and it feels like there's new artwork, there's new products, there's new things on the shelves for your wallet to be fatigued by, to be taken over with. And largely what people say is, well, that product isn't for you. And the statement is a little disingenuous. It's, it has a good meaning behind it for a lot of people saying it, but there is an unfortunate truth to it, where at the end of the day, when it comes to reskins of cards that you love or don't love in the case of Faithless Looting, it doesn't matter that there's an alternate art to it. If there's a secret layer giving you a different version of this card that is functionally the same, it's fine because it's not a different card. You can still access the card largely in the example of Faithless Looting, relatively so with its other printings. But where it comes down to the problem being is when you don't have access to that card, when that card hasn't been reprinted, when that card is the only copy that it is and it affects the format you're in, well then isn't the product for you? Don't you have to keep up? And that's where that product fatigue starts to come in. You have to pay attention to the cards that are being printed into these sets. Will it affect your Commander Pod, your Legacy League, your modern FNM? Will it be there across the table from you? And will you have to deal with a card that you've never had to plan for before that moment? And will we ultimately replace the decks that we're playing completely? Could we do it with Hadoukens as Lightning Bolts or Ethereum Sculptors as Supply Llamas? The Fortniteification of this game has taken an interesting route when it comes to the secret layers. And it feels like you're almost out of time. You don't have the wherewithal to react to any of this. Wizards will just announce things and you have to be ready for it. You have to be receiving and accepting. You have to love it all. You cannot criticize it because you're seen as a negative voice in the community. But critique is important and there's always a better way to implement these things. There is always a better way to do this and Wizards has already done so. Wizards has already fixed the universe is beyond problem, but they don't want to follow through. And when it comes to feeling out of time, out of touch with the gathering, it feels like Wizards has just tried to solve that problem with more products. With Doctor Who's Secret Lair coming around, if you aren't a Whovian, if you aren't someone that identifies with the Doctor Who multiverse, then well, you got universes beyond Final Fantasy coming out. This notably is a fake card, by the way, just stolen off the generators of Reddit. But the point still stands where if you don't identify with this IP, you might so with the other. And what that does is it draws people in. As an existing player, you might have IPs that you really kind of uh, acknowledge and uh, are a part of, such as Lord of the Rings. I was a big fan of that set. We had big personalities such as uh, Seth, uh, aka Saffron Olive, who wasn't really a fan of that. Not really much of a Lord of the Rings person. But that's fine. A prolific member of the community is allowed to like what they want. And unfortunately, as I just mentioned, Increasing product fatigue, increasing the amount of things that you have to keep up with is what Wizard Solution is. A kind of smoke screen of many, where if you pay attention to one product, if they just catch you with one, then it's fine. You can just ignore the rest of it. because You don't have the time for it. There's too much. But hey, the Final Fantasy set is good. So that's what you pay attention to. But that's where things become tricky. When there are so many sets, evidently at some point, something bleeds into the other. A card from one of these sets becomes playable in the other, as we see with Rick's Steadfast Leader getting 5-0s in Legacy Leagues way back when, when it was released, 2020 at this point, and taking the world by storm. Secret Lair, Walking Dead printing unique cards in that set. And in a way, breaking the immersion, we're bringing in a whole other IP, 
a whole other universe, a fantastical in a way, but not high fantasy. I guess if you want to uh, call Magic the Gathering that based on Lord of the Rings, it is not related. It's immersion breaking, as many would say, ruins your experience. It's different from what you expected on your screen. Now, cyberpunk glitches aside, we are coming to the stage of where you could be playing Legacy. You could have your bridge of Kaza Doom out, but then you know, your opponent casts a Chaos Deviler, destroying it, and then ultimately you have to block the Chaos Defiler with their Megatron. Now, of course, we see different iterations of these cards, different reasons why these cards work, and I specifically chose these three examples. If we go back again, the Bridge of Casa Doom, Chaos Defiler, this one uniquely so, and Megatron. Stick on to why I chose these specifically, because it matters for later in the video. Now, I do want to address the thing that one thing I hate about Universes Beyond is that specifically everyone keeps calling it UB and I, I don't blame people when it comes to Twitter discourse or just posts in general. There are a lot of character limits out there. So Universes Beyond are just a long set of words, so I get it. But small little first world problem. UB is for Demir. It is for the Demir household, the one that no one sees. And Universes Beyond is being used as that acronym. But Largely, when it comes to Ravnica, Demir, and Megatron itself, are these all in the same universe? Are these in the same lore, Vorthos? And I think that's really the question of the matter. That's another way that this breaks the immersion for people. Can I, as a, a planeswalker, traverse the multiverse and find myself in the world of The Walking Dead, the world of Cybertron, the world of X, wherever I might go? In a way, it works because magic was built on the concept of the multiverse long before Marvel and Kang uh, made it famous. It was there. And so that's a short way of explaining it off. It technically is an immersion breaking. People could technically say that you're being a bit of a uh, kind of prick about it, but I get your point. I understand that it's immersion breaking and largely I can concede to you in certain examples but the multiverse of magic does exist. And when it comes to different IPs coming together, no one does it better than Fortnite. As I mentioned, the Fortniteification of this game is one of the bigger problems that people have when it comes to the implementation of these universes beyond and the product fatigue at large. The amount of IPs that magic is looking to collaborate with is increasing at a drastic rate. It is no longer just with secret layers, but with full on sets that we're going to be seeing next year with Final Fantasy, currently with Doctor Who, with Fallout and so much more coming down the line. Where do these sets go? And especially with Fortnite, we see here in this chart that over the last couple months, Fortnite has relatively fluctuated in player base, but they've always come back with new things coming down, new, uh, I guess, implementations of the game, people always come back to try it. And that's what's key for Wizards. If you don't need to necessarily have players playing continuously, you just need to have them coming back and buying your product. However they buy your product doesn't really matter. They just need to come back and buy it. And that can be done with new players, returning players, or ongoing players. And that's another theme of you not being necessarily the primary target audience. This product isn't for you. And we see this with Fortnite, just the amount of things that they've collaborated with. Ghostbusters, uh, uh, the NBA, we have things like uh, Nick Fury was in it. And then, uh, I don't know, Moon Knight, Sh uh, Scarlet Witch. Uh, I don't know what cost Spiele is, but uh, it's all there. Fortnite has collaborated with so much out there from the WWE all the way to the Wu-Tang Clan. This IP has done it all, and that's where Wizards of the Coast is looking to take magic in a large sense. It, it's really hard to understand if this is just fantasy or real life when it comes to these things cross collaborating and the multiverse again does exist. It technically can be explained away. But what about some in universe examples? It feels like with recent sets, Wizards has been doing things that don't really make sense with the current lore of magic wands, fairies and goblins doesn't make sense with those things. And let's address some of those. Firstly, we have something like guns and arc splitter, something out of streets of New Kipena. Well, I'll tell you what, back in the age old day of good lore and magic, we had something like evasive action where a literal commando is shooting a gun at a gunship. Is this 
Warhammer 40k? Or just old magic lore? Or what about Aliborn Zealot with a literal rifle in their hand? I don't know what to tell you, folks. Guns exist in magic. They are there, they are part of the lore, and they are part of the multiverse. So there you go. But what about something like mechs? Giant Gundam suits that are introduced in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Well, isn't that technically what the Mur are? As far as I'm aware in the lore, these are a creation, an auto automation creation of Memnarch. Aren't these just robots that are being controlled externally? Whereas mechs are just controlled internally, technically can be controlled externally. They already exist. They are just hidden away and people just aren't aware of the lore as much. These uh, analogous things already exist. It's just when you call it something different, people get mad. People aren't aware of things when it's hidden away, but when it's shoved to your face, everyone seems to have a problem with what people's color of their skins are, what people's names are and all of a sudden. But at the end of the day, Magic is coming out with a space opera in the future. Get with the times. It's leaving you behind. There is so much more coming for the set and the sets to come, I should say, and the game of Magic itself that it's not really about whether or not the game is dying. The game is growing year after year. We see more and more profit coming out of Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast and Magic the Gathering and D&D holding up the dying animal that is Hasbro. But Magic the Gathering is not done. Neither is gaming, by the way. If you genuinely have this opinion, you need to stop playing Dota and Fortnite all day and go play a single player game. Baldur's Gate, Elden Ring, go play it. I'm telling you, your opinions about gaming will drastically change. That's a whole other topic. But when it comes to ex accessing different things and playing different things and changing your opinion about the game of Magic, Commander has become the beacon that is accessibility, a beacon that is diversity and expression and a way for players to show that you can have different things come together, meet each other across the table and just be as powerful with conversations, politics and microtransactions, uh, not in the money sense, but between players happening in the game to positively affect an outcome. It is the reason why Magic is still alive today. Commander has single-handedly grown the game to a more popular point. And there are other things that are affecting the game in a positive light as well. But diversity and expression are at the core tenets of the EDH and Commander format. And that's why a set or a format like this is really important. It's why Aragorn can be black. It, it doesn't really matter what the movies had shown. This is an expression of the characters within the game, and again, is why the multiverse exists. It's why different realms are there to kind of easily and escape, go to you right off the fact that this can happen. That's fine. Aragorn's color of his skin should not affect how your game plays, and if it does, you're a loser, honestly. Let it happen. Play the game. If this artwork was different, the card would still work the same. It's not about the semantics of the power of the card. The discussion should be around whether or not the card is accessible, whether it's reprintable, and maybe not so much if it's lore breaking, because as I've said for the 50 billion time, the multiverse is the cheap way to explain it all. And that's where we come to the discussion of Magic being a luxury product, a luxury game, and where accessibility is king for the player base, the people consuming the product. It's important that players understand that they don't want things like, you know, uh, super expensive commander decks. They want things like budget commander decks, things that cost $50 or less. Why the commander quarters is so uh, successful. It's why they don't want $1,700 modern decks or $150 popper decks. I mean, wasn't this supposed to be an accessible format? And I, look, all jokes aside, I cherry picked both of those examples. I just thought they were great. I love me some one land spy four color. I'm not, I, we can get something out of that deck. We, we can maybe not have that in modern, but the example still stay true. There are inaccessible ways to play the formats that you love. Things that certain players will have access to and other players will not. And that's fine. Those are for the gaming whales. As long as those decks aren't necessarily the super tip top best decks of the format, you can access other decks, that is okay. But again, throughout this video, I've talked about access. Access is important. Reprinting is important. That's why we come to the one ring. 
the one ring to rule them all and the one problem for all. How do we reprint the one ring? How do we take the the stalwart face of Magic the Gathering that is honestly probably no longer Black Lotus. I mean, why couldn't we do it like Godzilla? Back in Ikoria, we had a Godzilla King of Monsters, but right underneath it, you had that alt text that gave you some alternative card that it was actually a different face for. It was a different face for Zalortha, Strength Incarnate. So you could play the Godzilla art or you could play the Zalortha art. And the Godzilla art would probably eventually rise to some ungodly price, but Zalortha would stay where it is because, you know, what it could just get printed in the future and it could be cheap but then again it is just a reskin just like the faithless looting was why did it have to be like a rick steadfast leader and that was a question that was posed what do we do with rick steadfast leader how do we reprint it and almost three years later we are now seeing it being printed in packs today as grayman avison stalwart now they've attached it to a plane that many of us would like to revisit and that's okay now that we have a solution for it before Rick would have just become the second coming of the reserve list. No reprint plan whatsoever, but then the introduction of the list largely solved that. And that's probably what will happen to the one ring. The price will go up to some absorbent thing because modern players keep playing it. We do still have the holiday printing, but eventually they'll have to print a Grayment, an alternative to the one ring that does the same thing. And at that point, that card will probably have value, but it was then able to be reprinted over and over again. Their future Modern Horizon sets through standard sets commander sets wherever they want to put it that card will be available in the future and this is how they would do it but then why wasn't this done initially why did we have to do this with a card that is so sought after and i mean flavorfully it makes sense the one ring you gave them a one of one copy and then post malone bought it for two million dollars realistically speaking the one ring is the face of magic the gathering it's no longer black lotus people come up to you and they talk about how is that the one ring game? Is that the game that Post Malone plays? This is the direction that Wizards wants to take. it. We are no longer the set with crazy $50,000 magic cards that no one is able to play. No, we are the set with $2 million magic cards that technically speaking, everyone is able to access. We still have packs of magic, uh, Tales of Middle Earth still available today. And even in kind of sections like this here, I'm gonna remove my camera for a second here. Take a look at behind me on this recent TikTok video I posted about getting a turn one in Popper. Some of these comments are saying, what's this app called? What game is this? All I know is MTG Arena. It's kind of a hustle to manage the account. What's that website called? And it's interesting to see because a lot of players don't engage with the game in traditional ways that you or I do through Magic Online, through maybe even going to an FNM. They just have Magic Arena on their phone and they see a $2 million magic card and they wanna play paper magic, like, wow, I wanna draw a $2 million magic card. I love collecting. I love drawing lottery cards. Let's go open some packs. Let's try and acquire that myself. And that's how Wizards wants to get people into the game, attract people through the IP, open those cards, love those cards, play those cards, but you won't necessarily see it on something like Moto. You'll see it on Arena. You'll see it on paper. This is where the product isn't for you comes back. That product isn't for you. It's for the player that they're trying to draw in. That product has a set goal to attract a certain number of players into the game. But that can be done properly. There's an accessible way where we can make an alternate title or a generic name to then make sure that the reprints are accessible for these cards, where these things can be done in the future, where the one ring isn't just its unique card, but at the end of the day, Rick steadfastly to prove that they can do it again, so it's fine. Ultimately, it's fine. They can do it just like they did with Rick. And that's where things like that have to be okay because Magic Arena is the future of the game. Commander is as well, but on the digital front, it's not Arena. Although shout out to Daybreak Games for really pushing this client forward in many ways. Magic the Gathering Arena is the visually more appealing client. They will have Pioneer on it eventually. And heck, maybe if they actually do the right thing and hire some developers to, you know, make this client even better, maybe they'll put in eternal formats or maybe improve the other experiences on the game. But heck, people can win draft opens on there. $2,000 worth of Magic cards and freely accessible games at your own schedule. It is the future of competitive play of however misrepresented and misimplemented it is. It does a really good job at it. Come on, you gotta admit that. And when it comes to just implementing certain cards into the game, 
the one ring becoming the face of it really goes to show how cards like Garth One Eye are just nostalgia marketing at the end of the day, giving you the ability to create a copy of a Black Lotus, a card of age old, a Shivan Dragon, a Brain Geyser, but the Black Lotus itself I remember when this card was revealed, people were thinking, was this how Wizards beats the reserve list? Honestly, no, this is how Wizards brings in the older crowd into Arena. You can play Black Lotus on there. It is now coded into the Arena client. The effect is there. You can just put a different skin on it. And that way you can attract players that love cards like this, that use nostalgia marketing to say, hey, Garth One Eye is on the format, is sorry, in the game. And you can then play with the card access the card, enjoy the card, and do things like access Black Lotus, just like you did maybe when you were younger and playing the game back then in paper. Maybe you can't access the card now, but you can on Arena. The nostalgia marketing and the member berries goes wild. And for those of you not cultured enough to enjoy South Park, member berries are a uh, kind of representation of the nostalgia that many feel in pop culture these days. Specifically in South Park, the member Barry specifically talked about scenarios from the old Star Wars trilogies, but then had like an evil side where they had like really crazy, like uh, conservative thoughts as well. So it, it was just like hidden messaging. And largely what I'm trying to say is the member berries were a representation of collecting feeling of how music tends to sound the same these days and how classic story tropes are replayed over and over again in the magic sets that we see, the movies that we watch and the books that we read. Nostalgia marketing is everywhere. And if they can implement old cards like Black Lotus onto Arena, they will eventually replace them with cards like the One Ring and give you a new face and a new chase card for Magic players to seek after and a new marketing method that many players will run after. They will follow and they will love when it comes to that. And that leads me to my final thoughts. Where do I stand with Universes Beyond? I, look, I stand by Universes Beyond. Asterix, with a big asterisk, if they're implemented correctly. If the cards are done in such a way, such as with Bridge of Khazad Doom with alternate text, it is now an ensnaring bridge. If it is just a reskin of a card they can already have access to and they can print magic, that's fine. Reskins are great. That is meant to be someone else's product. That product is not for me. And I'm happy about that because it is for someone else while I can access the same card. But it should also have potentially a generic name, something like Orcish Bowmasters taking over the legacy, modern, and many other formats that is being played in. Taking over those formats, Orcs exist in Magic, Bowmasters do as well, so Orcish Bowmasters have a generic enough name where, honestly, they could be printed, such as Chaos Defiler from the uh, sets of Warhammer 40k. Chaos exists in Magic and Defilers exist as well, and so Chaos Defiler isn't necessarily tied in many Magic players' minds to Warhammer 40k. So if you have generic names, alternative text, then guess what? I am all for lore, uh, I'm all for Universes Beyond. But if they're implemented like Rig's Steadfast Leader, we're gonna have a growing problem. So Wizards of the Coast, I challenge you to do this. Future Universes Beyond sets that you have, as many unique magic cards as you have, make sure you have a plan as soon as possible to make sure those cards that will soon be inaccessible to be accessible in the future for competitive formats such as a Legacy and, and Modern, should you print cards into those, and expression formats such as Commander, where other players will come across these cards, give them a way to access these cards, and that is a solution to the Universes Beyond problem. No one will have a problem with Universes Beyond if they can access the card. If you keep the alternate arts exclusive, that is perfectly fine, because people will buy them. But what you're doing right now is a very sleazy way to just squeeze out money, and Big Daddy Hasbro may like you, but the players don't.